Okay, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me remind that we are going to record this session. So that means, again, that if you don't want to be recorded here, you may simply switch off your cameras. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for having decided to join the second day of this international workshop, expanding the penal landscape, the immigration detention phenomena. We got a wide number of inspiring presentations ahead today, but the second day is going to be opened by a plenary lecture, as was the case yesterday. And this plenary lecture is going to be given by Professor Yolanda Vasquez from the University of Cincinnati in the United States. It's my great pleasure, and those are not empty words. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Vasquez today. And the reason for that is that probably you all know this. Professor Vasquez is one of the leading voices in the field of immigration studies and uh, border criminology. And she is currently, I have already mentioned that, professor of law at the University of Cincinnati School of Law. And she held previously positions at the University of Pennsylvania, Villanova University, University of Nevada, Las Vegas in the United States. And she has been, among many other things, a uh, visiting professor at top international universities such as King's College London and University of Oxford, both in Britain, at the European University Institute in Italy, and at the University of Houston in the United States. And I began by saying that it is my great pleasure because I'm absolutely convinced that some of the best pages published on the relation between racialization processes and immigration enforcement have been authored by Professor Yolanda Vasquez in exploring the impact of immigration practices on Latinx communities in the United States. In fact, she published at least two groundbreaking articles in 2015 and 2017 on this. And I'm particularly in love with this book here. That is the book that was uh, co-edited by Yolanda Vasquez and University of Oxford's Alpa Parmar and Mary Bosworth that is called Race, Criminal Justice and Migration Control. And this book has many interesting, extremely interesting contributions by a definitely um, highlight the relevance and the insightfulness of the contribution authored by Professor Vasquez. So Professor Vasquez is going to lecture for around 45 minutes, and then we hope to have 15, 20, perhaps 30 minutes for um, the uneventual debate. Thank you so much. Let me leave the floor to Professor Yolanda Vasquez. Good morning. Um, and with that wonderful introduction, I'm gonna, that's going to be a hard act to follow. <laughs> so thank you so much, um, Jose, for that introduction. And I am actually really honored to be here. So I thank you and Anna for having me here at this um, workshop, I, which I believe is, is so important to be able to have a discussion um, across, across the world, really, um, in issues that are sometimes seemingly disconnected um, but are truly interconnected and um, until we have these discussions and i'll come to the table um, we can't begin to really understand how interlinked um, we are as a globe um, and in fact you know i know that within my own um, scholarship where i focus on the u.s we find even the laws for instance within the u.s um, sometimes, for instance, criminal law scholars will do just their um, scholarship within the criminal justice system, immigration scholars within the immigration system, and we're losing a lot of the interconnected relationship um, that is going on right underneath the surface. Um, and um, I hope that these discussions continue so that we can un unfold these. Um, so again, Thank you so much for having me and particularly because although I think from yesterday's workshop I realized or I seem to think that many of you um, do not have take issue 
with talking about race in the context of immigration. But unfortunately, that is not the, tru um, the truth in um, other formats or even within immigration. Many people believe that race is not connected um, to immigration policies across the globe. And it's just a matter of the quote unquote rule of law, not understanding that in fact, the rule of law has been created in order to maintain a particular racialized um, racial subordination within countries and, and what I am going to argue today across the globe. So um, I figured nobody would want to just see me for 40 minutes, 45 minutes. So I did create a PowerPoint. So I am going to share my screen um, with you on that. Um, although, where did it go? Hmm. How very odd. Let me see if I can. Jose asked me if I knew how to share my screen and I do, but um, it's not showing up for some reason. Let me try this again. Hmm. Okay. Let's see here. So bizarre. Never works when you want it to, does it? Okay, let me try this again. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. All right. So I will ask what everybody asked. Can you see my screen? Yeah, perfectly. Great. All right. So I named this um, this particular talk reinforcing racial order through crime and migration policies. Um, as Jose had mentioned, uh, my scholarship focuses um, within the impact of race and racism, but I focus on the issue of the of how it um, comes about in crime and migration policies, um, particularly focused within the United States, but um, based on my increasing visits across um, outside of the United States, I am starting to think about the way in which not only this happens in the US, but in other countries um, and for the benefit of those, some would say North, um, the Northern, um, part of the globe, but we know that, for instance, Australia, right, is not in the southern, um, in the northern hemisphere, but it is still um, very much a part of this, um, the impact that it, that it has on people of color. And so um, this picture actually is a picture that is by Anthony Russo that was um, done for uh, Isabel Wilkerson's um, review her the review that they had on her book cast in which she starts to um she talks about the relationship between um the caste system in india and the the system of racial discrimination that we have within the united states and brings about the similarities of the two and talks about that racism is really the only is an only a visible manifestation of something much deeper and a hidden system of social domination. Um, and that again um, is something, another mechanism um, is crime and migration policies. I think not only within the US, but probably in many of the countries um, where you are um, doing your research as well. And so part of this issue, and this is for the geographers in, in the room, is this uh, race, space, and place. And so this reinforce, reinforcing racial order through crime and migration policies really is about um, sticking people um, defined by race, whatever the social construct is on the otherness, right? Separating them through um, into spaces to keep them in their place. And so my... My premise is that crime and migration, um, particularly criminality we see legitimizes this anti-migration and immigration laws and policies. And it starts, um, it's created also through this rhetoric of criminality, dangerousness and national security, which we hear all across um, the world um, as a reason as to why we have to have certain migration um, enforcement of the borders. And also obviously why the rise in the criminal justice system is occurring um, across the globe, but particularly within the United States. Obviously we have the largest carceral system in the world where everybody knows, right? We um, 
we incarcerate 25% of our um, nation's residents um, while only having 5% of the world's population, the majority um, are impacted, right, are brown and black individuals. And as we see through crime and migration policies, a, a larger part of those brown and black individuals are actually migrants. They are not US citizens. Um, and so once we have this legitimation of um, migrants as criminals, as dangerous, as national as threats to national, national security, therefore we, right, as a society can then exclude them um, from the jurisdiction of the United States based on this um, dangerousness to the citizens of the United States and national security. For those who are already within the United States, right, they've already crossed the border, based on this perception of criminality and dangerousness, we can then deport them, we can remove them from the United States outside of its jurisdiction, and therefore, again, keep US citizens safe. For those that we cannot remove or not remove as speedily as we would like, we can also use that to contain them either through um, detention, which we know in the United States has been growing. And now I believe we have the largest detention uh, facilities in, in um, the world. It has been growing since the 2000s um, and probably will continue to grow. Um, and then of course, containment for those who are sort of um, caught between crime and migration policies. Um, they will either, um, again, detention is not only immigration detention, it can be detention within jails. And for those who are found to be citizens of the United States, they can still be contained within prisons within the United States or contained as we know in certain areas. Um, also, some would call um, ghettos or barrios within the United States to be um, contained away from um, white um, dominance or white neighborhoods. Um, this, of course, also acts as a way to exploit um, non-citizens of the United States. This exploitation, many people talk about um, labor. And so um, it's used, right? Labor of brown and black people is used um, in order to, for um, white um, society to be able to use that labor in order to gain profits. And in fact, we know, and we heard yesterday that um, that detention in and of itself is a pro profit-making scheme um, for many individuals, not only um, um, GEO and CCA, um, but as we were told, you know, Apple, Amazon, um, you know, things like, for instance, Wayfair, banks, all of those um, have been able to be profit, profiting on the backs of um, black and brown people. And so those are some of the ways in which I believe that crime and migration policies are able to um, actually write other, right, by race and then separate through space to keep people in their place. And when we think about it, when I first did started to do crime and migration policies, I, I thought about it within the context of the jurisdictional bounds of the United States. Now I'm actually extending that outside the jurisdictional bounds of the United States and seeing in the way in which by expelling people or excluding people, how that is affecting um, others globally for, um, and I know, again, we've talked about that in term uh, yesterday in terms of, for instance, how now Morocco, Turkey, Mexico um, is affected by this, not because, not only because they are either receiving, for instance, Mexico receives a lot of deportees, now transit countries are now um, keeping those immigrants in transit and how it's affecting um, the countries that are no longer transit countries and now are becoming um, destination countries as well. Um, and so just um, sort of brief, when we talk about the rhetoric of criminality, dangerousness and national security, at least within the United States, again, this is the basis by which laws and policies can be ma made and continue right in um, our society's understanding, the laws and policies are built based on this um, rhetoric. Um, 
these policies create more criminality, more um, dangerousness, more national security because the numbers are going up and therefore it fuels, right, more and more anti-immigrant sentiment. And this, as um, Allison talked about yesterday, also I believe is going with Asylees or, you know, her talk on the death of asylum, a lot of it, um, I argue, is based upon the fact that asylees are no longer seen as sort of deserving um, of our protection as a nation. What they are seeing is as fraudsters, right? They're criminals. They're, they're, they even talk about terrorists coming through. Um, and so again, asylees are losing their um, desirability based on the rhetoric of who they really are now, right? Dangerous threats to national security, unlawful entrance, um, crim, quote unquote criminals. And I put this in quotes because as many of us um, know, um, being um, labeled a criminal does not necessarily mean um, the worst of the worst. And of course the quote of crisis, um, the, the you know, immigration crisis that's coming in, which then fuels this rhetoric and allows um, these laws and policies to um, be created. And so um, when we talk about race, I think within the United States, some of the, some of the creation of this issue with um, unlawful entrance and who is deemed dangerous or a national security threat actually comes from the late 1800s. Um, in the late 1800s, the United States actually excluded um, Chinese laborers based on race. That was the first time the US explicitly excluded um, a particular group based on race. But a lot of the laws that we still have today was created in that racial animus. And even though race plays no, um, race is not on the books, right? All laws are facially neutral within the US. The, this racial animus um, and the racism that, came, um, that created the laws still manifests itself today. And so when we look at the language of Che Chen Ping, in which um, Che Chen Ping was asking, he was a longtime resident of the United States who had went to China to visit his family and before his um, boat docked, um, a new law came about that excluded Chinese laborers. Now he had permission to return, but when his boat docked, he was not allowed to come back into the United States. And so the question then became was, was the new law, um, constitutional. And so as you can see from the language within Che Chen Ping, first of all, they talk about um, security against foreign encroachment is the highest duty of every nation. Um, and um, all other considerations are to be subordinated. And it talks about specifically, it matters not in what form of aggression or encroachment come whether from the foreign nation acting in its own character or from vast hordes of its people crowding in upon us. And it says, if the government of the United States through its legislative department considers the presence of foreigners of a different race in this country who will not assimilate with us to be dangerous to its peace and security, their exclusion is to not to be stayed simply because there are no actual hostilities within the, within the nation. And we see, right, over the last uh, 50 or 60 years within the United States, more and more of this has been accepted, right, within the rule of law, right, the, the breaking of the rule of law, um, vast hordes, we see the language still, still continuing within social rhetoric. Um, and that in and of itself is, P, um, is enough to say that they are a national security risk. And it doesn't matter whether they truly are. So I think many people forget um, how important history is for us to be able to understand why these deep-seated feelings um, rooted in racism are just sort of explained now in just the basic breaking of the rule of law. And so as we see throughout um, US history, when the start of the Chinese Exclusion Act and also the increase when we started to see um, increase of Mexican immigrants into the US and becoming lawful permanent residents and 
um, citizens of the United States. And so prior to, they would move back and forth as laborers. They were always meant to be temporary within the United States. And so this issue of temporariness was based on their, again, deemed to be inferior to the right white race. So this issue of manifest destiny within the United States was that whites were superior and black and brown people were, were only there, right, to help um, maintain their superiority within this nation, to build the nation for them, um, to help them make profits, but not to um, stay and take up space. And so, um, again, this language comes from um, excerpts of what those in administration and also other leaders across the country were saying about Mexicans that they were mongrels, um, bastards, orphans, and vagabonds. And so that was another reason why, while in the 1960s with the Immigration and Nationality Act, in which they got rid of national origin quotas, which had um, not limited Western hemisphere countries, but Mexicans would still go back and forth across the border. But once we put limits on each country, Mexicans actually started to increase as well as other brown and black individuals, much to the chagrin of um, white, whites in the United States. Um, they were told this wasn't gonna happen, but it in fact did. And so while many of us um, obviously in the last four years have had to deal with uh, the rhetoric of the Trump administration and his um, racial animus, particularly against um, those from um, Latin American countries, Mexico and Africa, President um, Barack Obama was not um, someone who did not sort of play into the rhetoric. We know one of his remarks um, on immigration was that it's, it should be um, felons, not families, criminals, not children, gang members, um, not moms who's working hard to provide for her kids, will pr prioritize just like law enforcement does every day. Well, for any of us who work within law enforcement, we know that um, racial disparities within the criminal justice system have a lot to do in which the way police enforce laws. And in fact, um, some months before when President um, Obama had made speeches to the NAACP, he talked about the fact that race was, um, race was uh, particularly skewed with enforcement and within the criminal justice system and that he um, was doing, going to do something in order um, to try to minimize these racial disparities within law enforcement. There were some um, reforms that were done as an aside, it was interesting that many of the police reforms excluded um, immigration enforcement mechanisms. And so um, this disconnect again, um, or right, the fact that um, many, as we'll find out, many of these quote unquote criminals are actually not who we, um, what would define as criminals that we need to keep ourselves safe from. And again, felons, not families. If we look at the way that particularly communities of color are policed and put into the system in very different ways um, than white counterparts. Um, this particular speech really um, does little for understanding the way in which race impacts um, migration policies as well. And of course, you know, we have President, uh, former President Donald Trump, who during his presidential campaign and what many would say he won off of is his campaign that was definitely racially motivated and um, connected race with criminality, right? When Mexico sends its people, they are not sending their best, they are bringing drugs, they are bringing crime, they are rapists. Um, and so the question that became for me when I started studying this is, is crime by migrants on the rise? So one could say, okay, if we have uh, more and more law enforcement policing migration and we need to deport those who are defined as criminals, is it based on the fact that migrants are in fact committing more crime? And we find um, that DHS, right, touts um, that they are removing um, non-citizens who post the most serious public safety and national security threat. And yes, I am being totally 
um, sarcastic when I have this picture of a couple children that are in um, detention. So we know, for instance, that both violent crime and property crime has been declining um, since um, the 80, um, late 80s, early 90s, and in fact has been on the decline probably since the 1970s and by a lot. So here we have violent crime, we have property crime both going down at a time though when we see um, a surge in um, law enforcement and immigration based on criminal activity. So when we look at, for instance, the drug crime rates um, for US citizens, which is the top blue, we see that there is a bit of a rise um, we see that there's even a smaller rise for legal immigrants. Um, and then there is hardly anything for quote unquote, uh, un well, undocumented immigrants. So then when we see total crime rates, again, we see that the total crime rates um, for US citizens is upticks a bit in 2018. Uh, for lawful immigrants, this is also um, pretty steady. And then for um, undocumented immigrants, we see it steady and probably just a little down. But again, even when we look at this, we see that there's not much of an increase, if at all, but we also aren't taking into account the policing or the discriminatory policing that may be found um, within um, undocumented immigrants or um, lawful permanent residents or um, other lawfully entered immigrants. And when we do look at this criminality, so this is off of ICE fiscal year um, 2019 criminal charges, we see that the majority of individuals are actually deported based on traffic offenses, DUI, general traffic offenses, dangerous drugs, and dangerous drugs is not actually defined. So um, any drug um, within the United States conviction is a deportable offense, um, except if you're uh, had entered legally and you are um, had less than 30 grams of marijuana for your own personal use. So you get one freebie, everyone. So if you're lawful permanent resident, make sure you're, you're smoking or have less than 30 grams of marijuana. Other than that, it's a deportable offense and that's included in dangerous drugs. And of course, immigration offenses um, which are not seen as violent offenses and even are even seen as regulatory offenses, but one could argue they are. Um, and so when you think of traffic offenses um, and DUI, which in and of itself is not actually a deportable offense unless um, there's some other kind of um, violent intent, but they actually still um, have it delineated. And so when you think of traffic offenses, you think, wow, that, is that really the most serious individuals um, dangerous to the national security and dangerous to um, society? And you think, well, maybe not, right? And so you're really thinking that this is not traffic offenses as a crime, this is traffic offenses probably more or less driving Will Brown. Um, and then dangerous drugs and immigration. And so um, it just keeps going down and you see that um, the most violent offenders are actually not being deported. And in fact, when you think of the fact that they do talk about uh, criminals are the ones who are um, being deported, we see within this chart that actually non-criminals are being deported at a higher rate than criminals. And so the rhetoric, right, that's fueling these anti-immigration um, laws is actually not playing out in the reality of what we see in, empir in the empirical research that others are doing. Um, and again, when we think about, which is interesting, within the border is orange, um, outside of the border or at the border is the blue. And what we see during the Trump administration is we see that more people are actually being deported from the border. And so even though he had these high profile um, raids that his actual deportation um, did, was not any higher than um, under the Obama administration in, in, some, in some years. Um, and we know that Obama has been called the deporter in chief, but 
what Trump has been doing or the Trump administration has been doing was increasing the number of people who never got into the United States to be able to, for instance, apply for asylum or be able to seek some form of immigration relief, which I think is the wave of the, of, of the future. But yet we see right that migrants are also there's research that says migrants are less likely to cause crime we see that criminals aren't really being deported and those who are defined as criminals aren't really violent offenders and we see those who are getting deported are people of color mexico guatemala honduras and el salvador are the top four countries of deportation in the united states now the th we do see that as we know um this was on um, the bush under the Bush administration, under the Obama administration, and under um, the Trump administration, obviously we had the zero tolerance policy where those who were caught crossing the border were then subjected to federal prosecution as a criminal, right? So again, um, unlawful entry as becoming a criminal alien, being subject to deportation. We see though um, that it spiked during the Trump administration and it spiked because of his zero policy, even with families and children. So um, mothers and um, fathers were being prosecuted and that's why children were being ripped from them because um, children can't go into criminal um, jails, but they can go into immigration detention. Um, and so, but we see the dive based on COVID and now the title 42 expulsions where they're just being excluded from the border. Um, many supposedly are still supposed to have their credible fear hearings to see if they um, would be based, have a claim for asylum, but many are saying they're not even allowed to do that. Um, but yet, so we're seeing this unlawful entry, right? This rhetoric of criminality, um, breaking the rule of law, but we see that for the seventh consecutive year, actually visa overstays are exceeding what they call illegal border crossings, but yet there is no criminality for visa overstays. It's an immigration um, issue where somebody can still be subject to deportation, but they cannot be put in the federal criminal system and prosecuted as a visa overstay. Only unlawful entries can do that. And we can have a discussion on why that is. Um, but visa overstays, but yet, despite the fact that we see that visa overstays are more, right, are coming into the country and staying at a higher rate and therefore unauthorized at a higher rate, we're not doing anything about that in the United States. And also this idea, Mexicans are no longer the majority. Most are actually long-term um, residents. Um, more than 10 years, many more than 15, although uh, many may still not have status. And though when we think about how law enforcement plays a part in that role and ICE plays a role in getting rid of those long-term residents um, from the United States before they can claim any kind of immigration benefit. And so where is the U.S. population headed? And um, by the Pew Research Studies, they're saying that it's going to um, rise um, and keep rising and it's at a historical high now. And so if we're seeing since the 1960s that more brown um, and black um, individuals are coming in as immigrants and this was meant to be a white country, um, we can sort of start to understand why it is that these um, crime and migration policies are happening. And even though I have focused on um, what it is doing for the Latino community, we cannot, st um, we cannot stop the conversation there because many African migrants, um, and in fact, an increasing number of African migrants are trying to enter the United States, many of them because of the border across the Mediterranean is much too dangerous. And so they think it is easier um, or less dangerous to fly into South America and make the what 6,000 mile track um, through the Darien Gap, which is one of the most dangerous in the world um, in order to try to arrive at the United States. And I think um, probably at this point, even trying to get into Canada. And so an increasing number of Sub-Saharan Africans are coming in um, and they're getting refugee status if they make it. 
Um, and so, and they probably will make asylum status. And so one of the issues then becomes is how do we keep them outside of the jurisdictional bounds of the United States in order that more and more will not be able to come in and have an immigration status. Um, we do know that actually um, Asians um, are outnumbering um, his, uh, Latinos in the United States. And in fact, um, it is estimated that they will actually become the largest majority within the United States um, in not too long of a time. And again, this is the projected, sorry, this is the projected um, by 2065. So what can be done? And I say that in terms of an idea of manifest destiny, the, the idea of this nation was meant to be white. Um, and so this is the why for me. Um, if um, I've done the how and I've done sort of the what, but I want to talk about the why. And so um, Charles Mills um, in the racial contract talked about the fact that white supremacy is the unnamed political system that has made the modern world um, what it is today. And I think crime and migration policies play in that um, political system. It helps to make the world the way it's supposed to. And when I say the world, I don't mean just the United States. And I think many of us, um, or I, I hope that many of you will look at um, your research and look at the country in which um, you're researching and take a step back and see it in a framework of um, white supremacy and white dominance and how that shifts into why things are the way they are and why policies are becoming much harsher um, than they were before. And so when we think about laws and policies, I talk about remain in Mexico, safe third country agreements, other bilateral agreements, and funding of transit countries, because now it's not only, or I should even say now, for the last several years, decades, right, we have seen an increase in the countries, right, such as Australia, the UK, the EU, and its member states, the US, extending its borders across the jurisdiction, its actual jurisdiction no bounds in order to ensure that people don't ever make it to their the jurisdictional boundary of their country. And so, and then even if they do now creating policies where people have to remain in the, another country before um, they can establish some kind of immigration um, remedy within the United States or working with other countries now in order to send them to another country where they have to ask for asylum in that country. And we saw during the Trump administration, right? They did it for Honduras, El Salvador, uh, Guatemala, even though they don't have really a structure um, or other bilateral agreements. We saw, for instance, um, bilateral agreements in which um, Mexico now will um, help um, in the transportation of um, unauthorized migrants to their home country or obviously holding them. And of course, funding, right? We see that uh, the United States gave money to um, Mexico, for instance, to help um, with, their border, with their borders. And so this issue of the death of asylum and the rule of law and the rhetoric again is for instance, in the United States, anyone can apply to asylum who's physically present in the United States or at the United States border. And it talks about whether or not at a designated port of entry. So an asylee doesn't actually have to go and um, go to a port of entry um, or else be um, unable to ask for asylum. But during the Trump administration, we know that um, that was changed right through their administration, even though through the INA, um, that actually conflicts. And the rhetoric out there and US society still said, well, they should have come through a port of entry when actually our laws say that they didn't have to. And so again, when I go back to the um, immigration of immigrants from Africa or other um, Caribbean countries, we see more and more are coming into the United States. And so the issue again about what to do with this rising black immigrant population, again, is increased enforcement within the United States, containment, 
and containment either through detention. Um, and we see the detention facilities within the United States. The blue are um, actually um, jails and sort of criminal detention set, set, settings that were set up. We see the detention beds rising, right? More people being able to be detained, um, both for uh, Border Patrol and for ICE. We see profits that are coming in through um, GEO and Core Civic and other um, private industries. We see exploitation, um, remittances, right, are lost when people are deported. We see that um, those who are deported now are um, actually being employed by United States companies um, in order to, right, in order to give them lower wages. Um, there are, for instance, those who are um, deported for being um, for gangs, and they're now answering your phone call and they have to wear khakis and, and their white collar shirts and a little tie. Um, good enough to be able to answer your calls in another country, not good enough to have remained in the United States and obviously continuing with the profit um, and spending about who is profited and going back to Sorry, this is the same one. And of course, what I talked about is the moving of the border and ending with Charles Mills. Again, this white supremacy is the unnamed political system. And this border, again, this is the southern border of Mexico. This is not the US-Mexican border. And we see that um, the National Guard of Mexico is keeping out um, Africans who had traveled in from um, South, South America. And the money um, that was given uh, was given to the US in order for them to be able to form the National Guard. Um, and of course, um, Trump threatened Mexico that if they didn't stop migration, um, that they would be punished. And so we see this result. And so again, even though um, many of us, including myself, um, had remained confined within our own countries, we see that this is not this is not an issue that is confined within the jurisdictional boundaries of our, our country. This is something that is extending outside and going across. And so again, when we start with the US, this orange line immigration actually has control over, it's not just the border, it's with a hundred miles of the border where 75% um, of the US population lives. Now we can see the world map and we can see, right, we're extending, U.S. is extending the border through Mexico, through South um, Central America, and it's going to, right, and we see that the EU has relationships with Libya, Morocco, Turkey, in order to extend its border to ensure that immigrants don't get into, the, into um, their country. And of course, again, another Eastern European route, and we see, right, these agreements of keeping them away from um, keeping them away. And so uh, at this point, um, I will stop and open this for questions um, as to this continued use of or impact of race and racism on crime and migration policies. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you also because you, you actually use less than 40 minutes. So that means that we got plenty of time to engage in a conversation. Please let me remind you that you can pose questions either by reading them down on the chat device of this, um, of this Zoom or by you know saying there that you wanna pose a question. Who wants to begin the discussion? Okay, Audrey, Audrey Macklin, I cannot see you. I think that 